I would love you to stand with me, and we'll read the scripture, and then I could pray over our service. This is from Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. This same good news that came to you is going out over all the world. It is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know the Creator and become like Him. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you that this has been the purpose of the love that you and the Father and the Spirit as one have shared before the creation of all things. That you would have human children to pour out your lavish love to share in the overflow of your joy and your love and your delight that needs nothing, nothing more to be complete. But just because you wanted to, just because it brought you joy, we are here. We are the overflow of your love and your goodness. And you are determined to bring us home to make us shaped into the fullness of who you have always given us to be by your love and your glory. So we pray that this morning, by just hearing how much you love us, by being overwhelmed by the presence of your spirit among us to speak that embodied and fleshed love in front of us, by being reminded of a church that was called to the same thing and rose to the occasion to be more like you, that the world will get to see who you are. We pray this by the power and the joy and the amazing presence of your spirit among us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Please be seated. It's been such a gift to be able to be with you. This is my first trip to Jakarta, to Indonesia. My husband is here often, mostly in Bandung, as a conductor of an orchestra there, but this is my first time to come, and I feel really, really grateful. I also feel really grateful for the prayers of this church, because I spent uh, <laughs> my first trip in Jakarta, most of it in a hotel room, trying to get better from getting really sick. But God really met me, and this weekend has been such a joy to spend that time with you, talking about what does it mean to be an image-bearing people? What does it mean to be people who are not bearing the image of God by things we say, by things we propositionally believe, 
but by being concrete, physical, tangible, human expressions, vice regents, ambassadors, children, children of the family of the living God, whom God expects that where his children are, people know what the family looks like, that where we are, the world can see what God looks like that what we do is not just activities to try to please God, but that what we do is we literally manifest and exhibit the presence and the character and the power and the goodness and the love and the mercy and the justice and the compassion and the wonder and the beauty of God to a world that is broken but profoundly beautiful to him and that he is not abandoned. He has so claimed permanently as his own that through his son, he wears the dust of our created flesh. He wears the dust, the stardust, the DNA, the stuff that makes up the cosmos, that makes up us, is still in the body of Jesus of Nazareth. Son of Mary, still, as well as Son of God. That once he's taken on our image as humanity, we have finally been able to see what a true human looks like. And that that was set in place from the very, very beginning. That humanity set in God's created temple, palace, garden would be the place filled, breathed into by the Ruach of God's Spirit, that we would be the dwelling place of God upon the earth. And as we look at the life of Jesus, he is the one that we are always supposed to look at. We tend to do this really strange thing, which is to move to Acts when we want to look at what it looks like to be a disciple. Right? We move to Acts and we move to the letters. We somehow move into the later New Testament to go, well, what does it look like to be a follower of Jesus instead of maybe looking at Jesus? Wouldn't that be a concept? Only because most of us don't take Jesus' humanity seriously, we don't look at Jesus. We're like, well, that was easy for him because he was God in a body after all. Well, he wasn't God in a body after all. He was God and still is, who emptied his divine prerogatives to act like the Son in his divine privilege, to be united in his divinity to our humanity, our human life, forever, becoming nothing, human, taking on our form, our likeness, reclaiming human life through a life that is tempted all day, every day, to live a different, broken kind of human life, the life you and I know. Tempted in every way that we are to not listen to what the Father is asking him to do because it will cost his life. And it will lose him friends. And it will keep him from affection. And it will keep him from exercising power in the ways that would actually get something done the way that he might want it done in that moment. Or that might benefit him. He's tempted to want to have relationships that actually do something back for him instead of being surrounded by people who are only around him before what they can get out of him. He's tempted by the women who walk with him, close to him, who love him and care for him because he doesn't get to have a relationship because of the ministry that he's been called to. And he is tempted to love them well and to give them their honor back and to not use them, even in his imagination for his self-gratification. He is tempted to sit at tables and try to keep his mouth shut so that people like him better instead of plot to kill him faster. He is tempted to break 
and be like you and me every minute of every single day. And it is the deepest dishonor that you and I can give to him to say, well, that was easy for him. He's God after all. He said, no. If my brother and sister can't do it like I could do it as the son, how dare I come in their midst and do it in some other way and then turn around and ask them to do what I did if they can't do it? I have to do it the way they do it, which is open to the Spirit, obedient to the Father, walking in alignment to the things my Father is telling me in that same frailty, that same sense of weakness, that same wonder if he's hearing right, that same submittedness, that same empowerment. It's like, I want my brother and sister to be able to live that life, and the only way I can give that to you is if I do it first. And then if I do it first and I pull it off, then the death that comes with the broken human life that we're all in doesn't have the last word over your life. My life will have the last word over that death. Because my death is one that I give to the Father, and the Father has promised that if I will die with my brothers and sisters, that he will raise me from the dead. You do remember that Jesus didn't raise himself from the dead. He didn't say at the Last Supper, Got to just take care of a few last minute things here. Got to just get some stuff in order. And then I got a, a little suffering to do. We all know this cross is pretty horrible, but I'll be back. I'll be, I just got to get some stuff dead and done, and then I'll be back. He is leaving them with grief and hope, having heard his father promise him that he will not abandon those ones who he knows are tempted in every way that Jesus is tempted and break all the time. And then he ends up praying, Father, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me, like I have asked you to do a thousand times a day. From the day that you said that I am yours and have called me to ministry by your Spirit, and threw me out into the desert by the Spirit and tested me there and said, will you do it, son? Will you do it, son? And I said, yes. And then the enemy came in and said, really? You're the son of God? Will you do that? Really? You're the son of God. He says, since the beginning to this last minute, I have tried and walked to be faithful, and I want to be faithful to the end, but if there is a plan B to get my brothers and sisters home, please sign me up right now. This is the one who, because of this, it says in Philippians 2, which is a Christ hymn, and Colossians 1 that you just read part of is a Christ hymn that the church was singing. For this reason, the Father raised him to that place where he now sits with our humanity, human life permanently wedded into the triune life of God, sitting on the throne, finally doing the stuff that human beings were made to do. That's who he is. And he's about probably six inches shorter than me. And his skin coloring is a lot more like most of the people in this room than mine. And he's listening to us with a mouth that's grinning for good news. This Jesus, this Jesus is the one who we are to follow. And he asks you, listen with me to what the Father is doing, because I'm still busy 
I'm not sitting up here twiddling my thumbs at the right hand of the Father, waiting for the Father to send me back in some rapture story. I am busy ruling and reigning over all things in all places of Jakarta, in the Royal Kuningan Hotel where the Nordlings have been staying this week. And it is beautiful and wonderful. And as I look through my window, in the middle of the protest that's happening outside that window, and as I look through the other window, in the middle of the poverty that is sitting there, Jesus says, all things. I have become supreme, Colossians 1, over all things. Panta is the Greek word. Panta, panta, panta. Everything. I'm in all of it because I love all of them. They are mine. They are my brothers and sisters. They are your brothers and sisters. And where I am, I ask you to wake up in the morning with me, seated at the right hand of the Father with me. Ask me by the Spirit, what are we doing today? Where are you going today, Jesus, that you would invite me to participate with where you are. Not necessarily where I would end up if I chose it. Not necessarily where the world will give me kudos. And I'll be very tempted not to go with you where you are because I don't like to go with you where you are. And it'll cost me something. It might cost me my life. But I want to be like you because that's what you came for was to make me like you, to give me my truly human life back forever as a child of resurrection. This church in Colossae, they are one generation removed from people who knew Jesus. They have people in their church who know people in their church, who knew Peter, who walked with Jesus every day, being part of the crazy days that were Jesus' days. And Peter and the 12 and those who were around him and the women, they saw him not wake up in the morning and go, let me think, what miracle could I do today to let them know that I am God? He is waking up in the morning just like you and I, saying, Father, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help me pay attention and to not miss what you're doing. And Peter and the others are busy going, the Father's asking you to do what? We're doing what? We have to do what? And it's just getting worse every time we do whatever the Father seems to be doing. And we just seem to be going down this trajectory that if we go to this final Passover in Jerusalem, we're never getting out of here alive, you know. Or at least you're not. Jesus says, I know. But this is what the Father's doing, because you know what? It gives people life. So why would I try to protect my life if the character of God is self-giving life? for the sake of the life of the other. This church, Paul knows, but he doesn't know them because he started this church. He didn't start this church. He's never been to this church. He's heard all about this church. When you read the beginning, of, you just, if you just stood and read Colossians, which, by the way, that's how they heard this letter. Nobody got to read it in private. Nobody read Colossians in their devotions. Nobody got to borrow the papyri scroll and take it home, go, can I just like spend 20 minutes with Jesus in my time of reading Colossians today? They are getting a letter that is a public letter read to a community much smaller than what is gathered in this place, but right out in front, rolled open, read to everybody. And it's read out loud in front of everybody. Every time you read the word you in Colossians, you need to read plural. And there's another letter. Two letters came to this church at the same time. The second letter was to the pastor of this church and to his wife, who was co-pastoring with him. And we know that by the fact that he names her. 
And that letter is to a pastor named Philemon and his wife, Athea, and to the church that meets in their home. And that letter to Philemon was also read out loud in front of that whole congregation. And as Paul writes to them, he does so with a couple of really beautiful and really risky things in mind. He knows about them because they know people that they share in common. They have friends that they love. He's in prison in Rome. And there are people with him, Pacris being one of them, who is actually from Colossae, who's been taking care of Paul in prison, among some others, like Luke and a few others. He also knows all about them because the word about this church and their love for each other, their life together, the way that they have been shaped by Jesus, the way that they have seen Jesus in their midst by the power of the Spirit and are beginning to image the image of the invisible God in their embodied life as a community, the word is out about the church in Colossae, and Paul wants to celebrate them. He also wants to remind them that who they are is in the process of becoming, that as they're being formed, as their life is hid with this Jesus, who is the firstborn over all creation, but also the firstborn from among the dead, i.e. the firstborn of the resurrected human beings like you and me, who will be immortal human forever. That's our destiny, where we get to be busy doing the really cool things we were actually made to do with God. That's where this goes. That's the Christian story. And Paul says, on your way to being shaped into that, don't be tempted, like Jesus was, like we all are, to shift your focus. Don't start getting all about rule keeping, because that's really easy to exchange the gospel for a whole bunch of rules. And don't be afraid about your life in the spirit, because your life in the spirit the Spirit of God is not comparable to the spiritual powers of Colossae that you are worried about. And as he writes to them to encourage them, to bless them, to love them, to keep reminding them as you are taking off your old self and putting on the new self that's being renewed in the image of the knowledge of your creator and brother who happens to be the Lord of the universe, your life together is on display to the world. Now, they are a crazy bunch, y'all. The, the church in Colossae and Heropolis and Laodicea, these three cities that were close to each other, each of them had churches. And at the end of Colossians, Paul mentions them. He's like, and please give my greetings to so-and-so, and, and we'll look at a minute, a couple of who those folks are. But he's like, I, I want you to say hi to them from us who are here in, in uh, prison in Rome, and, and I want you to pass the word on to this. And, and by the way, please, like, please give my greetings to Nympha, because she is a fantastic pastor of the church at Laodicea. And by the way, I've sent a letter to her, and I want to make sure that the letter that she is getting to read out loud to her congregation, that you switch letters so that you get to be encouraged by the things I say to the church in Laodicea, and they get to hear what got said at Colossae. So take care of that, okay? There's a lot that he's doing. He, he's wanting us to hear and see, as he's saying, put on this new life together, be shaped in your new life together. There are women and men together in this space who have never been together in a space like this, in the history of the world. Look around this room. We take this room for granted, that there are men and women of different ethnicities, different aspects of privilege, different cultural backgrounds, coming from different religious backgrounds, 
that had never existed until the time of churches of Jerusalem and then out into Asia, Colossae, Macedonia. No Jew ever sat in the same room as his Jewish wife. Women and men did not worship in the same space, and no woman was standing up here preaching to a Jewish man who woke up every day and said the blessing, thank you, God, that I have not been born a Gentile or an animal or a woman. No Gentile really wanted to have anything to do with these weird Jews who were cutting up their bodies and having one God instead of umpteen, when the more the merrier if you're a Gentile. They did not want to have things to do with one another, and the Jews specifically were doing this because they thought Yahweh loved them more for it. If I eat with a Gentile, I'm going to have to break my dishes because that unclean person just touched them, and now I would be unclean and unholy. So I will never, ever enter their household. I will be hospitable to them to the degree that the law tells me I have to be, but I will never see them as a human being. And in this little church in Colossae, there are Gentile women, slave women, who one week could be preaching to a Jewish man and his wife, or his daughter, or his brother, and the next week, not. That it would switch around. That in this community, if they were slaves in that culture, they had all kinds of responsibilities, but they had no rights or privileges. But in this space, Paul says every time, every time, in these spaces, when you gather as a people imaging Jesus Christ in the world, none of that earthly world perspective stuff that tells you the narrative of who you are running around in the world at this level, that is not the true story of what God is doing. That is not the true story of who you are. You do not act that story in this space. You get transformed in this space to act you the future in this space. And in the future, a final people is finished whom God has converted and changed into his image so that people can look at them and their life together and their love for one another that no one has ever seen and said, God looks like that? Could I, could I please know that God? Could I be part of your fellowship? Where privilege of this world doesn't make us privileged in that space? We are all just radically privileged brothers and sisters of Jesus of Nazareth? This is an amazing thing that God has been doing and building, and Paul has been part of this mission and this ministry, and he loves this church. This is, in his own story, Paul having to be converted and learning forgiveness. He blesses them for their quickness to love and to forgive. And he challenges them in this letter to do it better. And then when he finishes out, one of the people he says, uh, by the way, I, I want to send greetings from John, Mark, who's been wonderful with me, and I've sent a letter to you about him. I want you to take care of him. The last thing we know from Luke's telling us in Acts about Paul and John Mark is what? They do not part so well. The going is hard and it is rough, and John Mark chickens out. His life is more important than the cost of his life for the sake of the other, and Paul knows he cannot afford that in ministry. It will probably cost their life, and you can't be in it if you're not willing to lay your life down and let the one who raises the dead give it back. And he says, Barnabas, we can't take him. And Barnabas says, give him a second chance. 
he's my relative, give him a second chance, Paula goes, you give him a second chance, you go with him, I take Silas, I'll do my thing, we'll go and do the thing that we need to do. This letter tells us there's been amazing reconciliation. And there's other, the letter to Romans. You see, you see many times where Paul is referencing a belovedness that these two brothers, older and younger, have found one another, have ministered together, have grown together, bearing the image of Christ together better by their life together. And the only reason I point that out is that there is something else quite profound that is happening as he gives them this letter. He gives it to them through two messengers sent all the way from Rome. One is Tychicus, and he says, hey, I'm, I'm sending Tychicus. This is the Cherith B. Nordling uh, paraphrase version. Why don't I just read Paul's version? <laughs> says, Whoops, might be good if I actually had to open to Colossians. He says, Tychicus will tell you all about the news regarding me. He's a dear brother and a faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord. And I'm sending to him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He's coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who's one of you. In other words, who's from Colossae. They will tell you everything that's happening here. And then he says, and by the way, Epaphras, Aristarchus, just lots of beautiful, so-and-so says hi, just want you to know, work together in this. Now this was a people who was being shaped by listening to the Spirit to teach them to be like Jesus. And it's hard. And it's easy for us to go and look back at a letter like this and not think it's as hard as it is. But it is hard. It's hard to take Jesus seriously. I spent a, a summer really trying, it's not a summer, I started a few summers ago and have been continuing to just spend time in the Gospels with Jesus as a disciple of his saying, if in fact you were tempted in every way that I was, and if this is what seems to be happening in your day, then I want to ask you about it. I have a thousand questions about that day. I want to ask you, how did you hear the Spirit? How, how were you sure that was the Holy Spirit? How did you do that thing? Or I just kept asking how questions, but it was mostly because I just wanted to, to listen in and learn from and think, if I was with you, if I was one of the 12, and I couldn't figure out what was going on, what would I have asked you? Because I want to do what you do. And I tend to talk myself out of it. The enemy simply has to say to me, Cherith, you're making it up. Because I really want to hear. And sometimes the Lord asks me to do really interesting and odd things. And I usually think, this cannot be the Lord. I must be making this up. It happens, right? One time I was standing in front of a group of many, a couple thousand people, giving a word I did not want to give because I was afraid to give this word. And I had been fighting the Lord, fighting the Lord. And he just put me flat on my back in a hotel room for today. Oh no, maybe that was what's been. <laughs> maybe I spent five days in a hotel room this week in Jakarta because there was something else I was supposed to be doing. But anyway, that day I knew that I was laying in bed sick because I just didn't want to do what the Lord asked me to do. Because it was a hard and scary word to give to a people I didn't know. And I thought, Jesus, you must have felt that way sometimes. But I finally did what he asked me to do, and God showed up, and he was moving on people, and I was just so grateful, and I was kind of trying to make my way off the stage as people were praying and falling down, and just the Lord was just moving and doing his thing, and the, the people who were in charge were leading in ministry and time, and I was just like, thank you, Lord, like, time to just, like, quietly move off this very high stage, and as I'm moving by, I see this woman, and and. I know I'm supposed to pray for her. And I'm like, Lord, 
the stage is like very, very, very high. Her chin is about right here. And I'm wearing a dress, and I don't really want to get down on the stage. It must just be me. Or if I pray for one person, I'll have to pray for 50 people. I mean, listen to me, real holy woman, right? I just was tired, and I felt like I had just barely, barely been obedient. And I start walking off that stage, and the Lord's like, just pray for her. So I got down on my knees, and I just got in front of her. I said, could you tell me? And she says, you know, as you were speaking, I felt like the Lord was calling me back to my first love and that he really had given me a call. And she said, my husband's ministry and life and the Lord and our church has just really been flourishing. And I've just been feeling like I've been shriveling up and shrinking inside, and I'd really love you to just pray that God would bless me. And I look at her and I just say, yes, the Lord would love to give this to you. Of course he would. It's his desire for you. But you can't have that affair that you're about to start. <laughs> I don't do this very often. <laughs> And she's just looking at me, and I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, usually when you sort of offer a word, you do it tentatively and kindly. And it was just like, boop. It just like fell out of my mouth. And she just is like, no, no, no. It's my tennis instructor, and I'm leading him to Jesus. <laughs> and I said, you know what? He, you don't need to lead him to Jesus. Jesus will lead him to himself. And I said, I think that you feel like you haven't been seen for a long time. And your tennis instructor sees you. And Jesus wants to tell you he sees you and he loves you. And he wants to fill you with his spirit and his love and his compassion. In the doing of those weird, odd moments, those are the things I was trying to practice with Jesus. As I'm, and I, pr I encourage you to do this. As you're reading through, watch this particular day that I was reading this. Jesus is tired. His, his cousin has just been murdered. He's just gotten word of this. He is exhausted from teaching. He wants to get out of town. He needs to grieve. I'm sure he's got a thousand questions, like if this is how close this has just happened to John, Father, when is my death about around the corner? Do we really have to do this? And instead, he gets in that boat and he sees people basically racing because they won't let him go. And instead of doing what he would do in his weariness and his grief and his tiredness, and what I think the father would generally say, go grieve, let me comfort you, let me be with you. For what odd reason that day the father says, son, Turn the boat around. They have to hear some more. So he does. And it's in the middle of that tired, hungry, weary day that people get hungry and, and that whole crazy story of the multiplication of bread happens. Now Jesus, I can promise you that morning, did not wake up and go, I know, I'll multiply bread today, that'll get them. Even in that day, I'm thinking, Jesus, how did you hear that? How did you trust the disciples to be part of that with you? These are the kinds of questions that this church is also learning to lean into and to ask, what does it look like to follow Jesus? And Paul knows that that's what they're doing because that's what he's doing. And with this, I close. The two people who delivered this letter, one was Tychicus, the other Onesimus. Paul writes a letter to Philemon and he says, and to the whole church, Onesimus, who's standing right here, who's from your church, the last time you saw him, Philemon, he was a slave in your household, and he stole from you, and he ran away. And you haven't seen him since. 
But if, if, in fact, you need him to pay back whatever he owes you, I'll pay it back. But really, do you need him to pay back? Because actually now, the one who's standing here is not just your runaway slave who I sent home. He, God caught him. He was running as far away from you as he could get, and he ended up in Rome, and God caught him right into our arms. And he became forgiven by God and forgiven by us. And his name, Onesimus, which means useful, he has been God's useful, beautiful blessing and gift to us. And we return him to you not as a slave, but as a brother in the Lord. Will you forgive him? Will you receive him in to your fellowship as a brother? Because the whole city is watching you. The world is watching you to see if you will do the radical love and hospitality and mercy and grace and generosity and life-givingness for the sake of the other that is the image of Jesus in the world. What you do with Philemon, what you and Apthia and the church do, that's what Colossae will think God looks like. So what are you going to do? And we know that they took him in and that they loved him and that they raised him up. Why? Because we have this letter in the New Testament. We have Philemon still in the New Testament, and they wouldn't be there if this people had not caught the vision and leaned into by the Spirit the very hard thing of receiving him in instead of the very easy worldly thing, which was Philemon's right, which was what do you do with runaway slaves? You do the same thing that you did to Jesus of Nazareth. You crucify them. So Colossae will either see Onesimus hanging on a cross, or they will see Onesimus gathered into a community as a new member of the body of Christ. And what's even cooler and more profound to me, it's not just that it's here, but there's a little letter written by Ignatius, who was a church father about a generation later, and he was on his way to Rome to be martyred. To be burned at the stake. And he writes to the church in Ephesus, and church tradition holds that they believe this is the same person. He says, I'm so glad that you were with me, Ephesus, in the person of Onesimus, church leader, bishop, such a man of the love of God who has loved you so well. What a privileged people of God that God would give you such a leader, and you deserved him. The choices we make to actually look like Jesus by the power of the Spirit will change not just our own lives, but the lives of one another and the lives of the world around us. And they will only know what Jesus truly looks like, not by you telling them and then having nothing to see, but by who you are as a renewed people of God in Jakarta, Indonesia.